last five weeks, we've been looking at the Christmas story and we've been talking about the dreams, the dreams of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the dreams of uh, the young lady who um, always dreamed of getting married and the perfect wedding and all those wonderful things. You know, Mary, things didn't turn out quite the way she thought. Come to find out, it turned out a lot better. Joseph thought everything was going to be wonderful. Then he lost all of his dreams, and then God brought all those things back together and gave him so much more. I think Mary and Joseph probably had one of the most spectacular marriages because of how they began. They had to really lean so much upon each other, and they prayed to each, prayed the Lord together, you know, and there was pr probably some times they were scratching each other's head. And could you imagine parenting the king? Wow. But today... We are closing out 2023 with all of its highs and all of its lows. And as we walk into 2024, by the way, it's coming whether you like it or not, right? Just wake up tomorrow morning. You'll be there. I remember the days we used to have watch night services. How many of you know what watch night services were? They would line up a whole bunch of preachers and we'd preach until the new year came in. People prayed for the new year to come. <laughs> and then we'd all get together and have breakfast and go home. Like you want to eat breakfast at one o'clock in the morning. But I pray 2024 is going to be a great year. It's going to be unexpected because 2023 brought some unexpected things. So it's, uh, all I know is, is God looks at it and says it's good. All things work together for to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Y'all okay with good? Y'all like better? Y'all like best? I mean, I want best. And things are going to be different. Things are going to be different. I mean, we've got some loved ones in glory this year. We, we, we've turned some people over to the Lord. We've had some loss. We've uh, faced some things that we didn't think that we would have to face. You know, I thought 2022, I'd face some things and put those things in the rearview mirror and praise God, hallelujah. 23 came along and facing some more. That's all right. As long as God's on the throne, amen? I want to talk to you today about... So, let, let's... A life of David and what God taught the life of David. So if you have your Bible, Psalm 16. Psalm 16. It has a superscript to it. Uh, most of your Bibles will look at it and it'll say Psalm 16, a, a mechem of David. That's Hebrew. Mechem. Sounds like I'm clearing my throat. I don't know much Hebrew. But they like those <laughs> things in it. I went to Korea and, and I had a translator. And the very first sermon I preached, it was the president of the only Southern Baptist seminary we have outside of the United States. And, and he was there and he was my translator. I felt like I was in hot, high cotton. And, and I would say a line and he would say a line. And I'd say a line and he'd say a line. And y'all know me, I get after it a little bit when I'm preaching. And we got in a little bit of a rhythm together. And all of a sudden he started going, Arr! I thought this man's going to die right here in front of the whole church. My translator, what's going on here? Come to find out in the Korean, in the Korean dialect, if you went, Arr! it added emphasis to it. So I, he was preaching a whole lot stronger than I was. Now, that has nothing to do with the Hebrew, other than the Hebrew is very hard to pronounce in there. This, this, this word, hark, kim, nobody knows what it means. Now, well, then why are you talking about it, Brian? Well, it's in Psalm 16. It's also in David's Psalms, Psalms 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. It's also there, too. Most likely, now, when I say most likely, that doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. But most likely, it was a poem. It was a poem that David wrote. It was a contemplation. And if you look at the context of these unique psalms, 
it's a context of looking to God for God to take care of you. And how many of you are grateful for grace? How many of you are grateful for mercy? And in these unique Psalms, he is grateful for the grace of God, but he's also grateful that God in his mercy is not giving us what we deserve, not giving us what we think that we want. He's giving us something better. Now, oftentimes we come to God and say, God, this is what I would like for you to do. Matter of fact, our prayers, our prayer list at church, oftentimes our prayers are, Lord, would you do this? Would you do this? Would you bless this? It's kind of like we're telling God what to do. We're telling him where to work, who to bless. Matter of fact, we'll even tell him how to bless, who to heal. Am I telling the truth? How many of you have stupid relatives? I'm looking around to see if my kids are raising their hands. And you look, look at them and you say, oh, Lord, would you just, Lord, would go down there and tell them, straighten them out. Tell them I was right and they're wrong. How's that working for you? David, when he wrote these, had something on his heart. He didn't put the tune to these. These are songs. And they would be sung to a different tune that they, everybody already knew. How many of you know that Amazing Grace was written to the tune of a bar song? How many of you would have stomped your foot and said, I will not sing the Lord's songs to a bar tune? Well, y'all do it all the time. How many of y'all like Amazing Grace? David did not write the tune for this. But it was the contemplation that David had that was very important. And as we look at Psalm 16, it's almost a testimonial of walking through difficulty. Joining God's will, God's way, and understanding God's provision. How many of you know that with advancement often comes adversity? And without adversity, there is no advancement. Yet in our heart's fervent prayer, we pray that there be no adversity. How many of you would like to go to heaven on the soft, smooth track of grace? Anybody up for a disturbance? Kind of quiet in here. How many of you know that God's going to get us to where we need to be no matter what it takes? He's going to teach us whatever He needs to teach us in whatever way that the Almighty who cannot make a mistake, as He deems best, He will let you walk through, endure, feel, enjoy, Whatever is best for you, for your benefit, and for His glory. Look what he says in verse 1. Preserve me, O God. Preserve me. The word means keep watch over me. How many of you like it that God would keep watch over you? He knows every hair on your head. Virgil, it didn't take very long for you. It's taking less and less time for me. He knows every thought in your heart. He knows every motive. Uh-oh. When you would never say a word to anyone else, you would keep those things to yourself and only you know, well, God knows too. Don't answer this question. How many of you covet? How many of you covet but nobody else knows? 
God knows. How many of you lust? How many of you lust, but nobody else knows? God knows. So God may want to watch over you, but he also wants what's best. And that's the second part of this word, preserve me. It's not only that you watch over me, but it, I hope you're listening. It means take charge of me. Lord, I'm grateful that I'm not the one in charge. I'm grateful that you're the one in charge. I'm grateful that there are some prayers that you didn't answer the way I wanted you to answer them. I'm grateful that you vetoed. I'm grateful that you gave me something better. So David is saying, Lord, I am so very grateful that you will preserve me, take charge of me. He says, for in you I put my trust. How many of you trust God? Come on, this is church. How many of you trust God? Amen. How many of you trust God when things are difficult? Got a little murmuring in there. Oh, yes, I do. I wish he'd do it differently. Well, David began his life in the plains of Bethlehem where the sheep were out in the field. He kept watch over the flock at night as well. Seemed like his family would all would be in the family business, but David kind of was drawn to that. And his job was to keep them safe and hopefully keep himself safe in the same manner. A lot of people in that day would be in the family business and, and literally would never move very far from the family home. As a matter of fact, they may be in a very small five, six, seven mile circle that they would spend their entire life and never get outside of that five, six, seven mile circle. But God had other plans for David. So while he was tending sheep, he began to go through some things that you and I would not like. How many of y'all have ever fought a bear? You know, there's always one idiot at the fair that wants to go in there and fight a bear, right? Starve that bear for about three weeks and put him in there without a nozzle on his face and see what happens. Go up there and slap that bear in the head and see what happens. Yet, it was David's responsibility to take care of the sheep, and when that hungry bear came, aren't you grateful God took care of David? We wouldn't have of the line of a tribe of David, of the Judah. We, would, we wouldn't have from the, the lineage of David, the king of kings. I mean, we'd have somebody else, because David would have been bear meat. And then a lion comes. Now, I don't know which one came first. Do you? But it doesn't matter to me. I wouldn't want to fight either one of them. But what he found out was that God would take care of him as long as God was in charge of him. He was putting his trust in God, and it really didn't matter what he faced, whether it was a giant named Goliath, whether it was a Philistine army, whether it was the king who wanted to kill him, whether it was the entire nation being faithful to the king, and, and he was in danger wherever he went, he knew that the God of heaven was watching over and could preserve him. He says, Oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord, my soul is speaking and crying out to God, saying, You are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. I am nobody. I am nothing. I'm just the little shepherd boy without your blessing. By the way, the quicker you learn that, the better it'll be. He says, I know that there are those that trust in you. Look in verse 3. He says, as for the saints who are on the earth, those people who are seeking to walk after the Lord, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Literally, I love how the New Living Translation says this. They're my heroes. How many of you have heroes? 
Those people who just have walked with God and trusted with God. Janice's brother was one of my heroes. He went to see Jesus this past week. And Jimmy Eccles, he, he was just a, he was such a wonderful man. And, and he, was, he, was, he was about that tall and had the bluest eyes you've ever seen. And he loved God and he trusted God. And you know how God grew him in be, into being this great man of God? He made him a farmer. How many of you know farmers don't always have it good? And Jimmy talked to me about the times when they were about to lose it all. They lost the peach crop. And they topped it off the next year by losing the next peach crop. And then he said, and things come in threes. And he said, I lost the next peach crop. But you know what he did? He worked every day all year round. Whether you lose the peach crop or not. Because God is there taking care of you. And, and, and to Jimmy, what he knew was God was Lord. Master. So you can just Trust Him. Those are the ones that I look up to. Those are the heroes. It says here, in whom is my delight. It says, I take pleasure in them. Church, look up here. I take encouragement in them. When you're going through something and, you've, and the weight of it is pushing you down, isn't it good to, to look at someone and say, you know, God was... God never let them go. God was always with them. My best friend and his wife are here today. Jeff Freeman, love you, brother. We have a mutual friend, Clarence Davis. He was kind of like my mentor. He was born in 1918. For some strange reason, he loved me. And he was older, and I was green as green could be, and he had patience with me. And he was one of the wisest men I've ever met. And when I was going, my very first church, he was in that church, and, and boy, did I make mistakes. Jeff, be quiet. <laughs> Jeff was part of that church. And I, I mean, gosh, I only made mistakes every time I turned around. But for some strange reason, that church just loved me anyway. They knew I was green. They knew all those things were going to happen. And they just, they just, but I could look to Brother Clarence and I always knew that you could follow his advice because it was, it was straight from the throne of heaven. And he encouraged my soul. There is a way that seems right unto a man, all but the end thereof are the ways of death. But there's a way that seems peculiar to us. But it's the things of God. I'm reading a book now called The De-Churching of the Church. The De-Churching of the Church in America. People are walked away from the church. They're walking away from the morality in the church. They're busy. Church is no longer a priority. Church is, yeah, maybe if I got good time, maybe if, maybe if I feel good about it, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. But you know, um, couple we'll have today. We'll probably have fifty percent of those that are here will be watching us online. When 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 COVID hit. Mark, how many people watched this online? Four, five, yeah, maybe. Depending on the Sunday. Now it'll be 50, 58 watching this online. Now, I don't know about people. That's how many plug in to watch us. I can't look through and see how many people are watching. That could be 58. It could be 75. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how many it could be. It could be more. But praise God they're watching I wave at you, not point my finger at you. At least you had the intent to plug in. But y'all listen to me. Forsake not the assembling of yourself together. Is that scripture? If, if it's truth, if it's scripture, it's for our benefit. Would y'all agree with that? But yet so many people are missing the benefit of it because 
they got something else to do real quick, and they're just going to gonna pop in. I wonder how many people are popping in and popping out when they're watching. You know, two men. If the preacher sounds pretty good, I'll listen to him. If he doesn't, if Mark don't sing my favorite song, I'll just turn him off. I don't know who does this, right? If I got you in here, if you get up and leave, I'll watch you. <laughs> Be embarrassed, right? This is what is happening, in my opinion. Might be wrong, might not be right. I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to assimilate God to us. We're trying to invite God into our lifestyle. We're trying to get God to come and bless us where we are. And God's trying to get us to join Him. He's trying to assimilate us into His truth, his spirit, he's trying to get us to thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. He's trying to get us to walk the heaven walk now and not wait till we get there. But what we're wanting is we're wanting God to come into our life and bless our life and make it sweet and comfortable. And by the way, God, you better get with me before you try to change something because I might not like that change and, and I'm going to push back. Oh, preacher, you're being dramatic. When the Christ came, the Son of God, the visible God in Jesus Christ, the people who should have accepted Him and rallied around Him and fell at His feet, and applauded him and, and, and stood with him, crucified him. Now, if he had come in and joined them and done it their way and not rocked the boat, they would have loved for him to come in and kick Rome out and set up the kingdom. And like Judas, Lord, if you'll let me be in charge. Even James and John came to him and said, well, when you enter your kingdom, can one of us be at the right hand, the other at the left hand? You know what? They wanted power. But what if God says, I want you to be a servant? Oh, I can tell you're not too sure about this. Can we take the words of Jesus? In Matthew chapter 6, y'all ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount? This is what the Word of God says. Verse number 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, what your, or nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. How many of you fret over the comforts of life? Jesus says, no. Life's more than that. I had about 20 of these, and praise God, I'm not going to give you all 20 of them. Look at verse 35 of chapter 10. Matthew 10, verse 35. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be that of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Is that truth? Are we looking for God to come in and bless us? Or are we willing to come in and say nothing else matters but him? No other priorities but him. in chapter 19, Matthew 19. You're going to know this guy immediately when I read to you verse number um, 16. Now behold, one came to him saying, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What is it you want me to do? After a conversation with him, Jesus said to him in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, mature, complete, lacking nothing, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Jesus knew this person, and he knew that he had a lot of earthly possessions. So he says, those possessions, those things are getting in the way. Go get rid of all those things that are getting in the way. Go get rid of all the money, and then come and do the Jesus walk. Do the heaven walk here on earth. You know, like when he told his disciples to go out in twos and, and don't take any extra clothes. Don't take any food with you. Just go out there and do ministry and, and lean upon me and I'll provide everything for you. That's like saying to you, y'all go to, y'all go to, get in your car and, and take off and go to um, name a state. Alabama, well, that's not far, but we'll say Alabama. We'll go to California through Alabama. Let's not. Let's go to New Mexico. We'll get close, but not all the way. And by the way, leave your credit cards here and, and take all the money out of your bank account before you go and give all that away. Leave your suitcase here. You just go and trust me and I'll provide for you every step of the way. Any volunteers? Why? Lord, don't make me walk by faith now. You, you, you might have to be Lord. I, I, I would be uncomfortable doing that. Hold on. Were those Jesus' words? Yes. If you have the Bible in the New Testament, it has red letters. Everything I just read to you were red letters. They were Jesus' words. Were they true? Would they make you uncomfortable? Absolutely, they make you uncomfortable. Does that take away the truth? But yet in the church today, in our lives today, we're very comfortable with things being comfortable. As a matter of fact, we can tell God how to make it more comfortable. When you face a problem or a difficulty, when you face something that's bigger than you, are you going to God and say, whatever brings you the greatest glory, that's what I want you to do. Are you praying the Jesus prayer, not my will, your will be done? Because that's where you're going to see the, that's where you're going to see the real good stuff start flowing. But, but what we're trying to do is get God to come and assimilate down into our world instead of letting God assimilate us into his world and his thinking. You know what that's called? We have idols. Oh no, I don't have idols. I go to New Holland Baptist Church. Bless you. Bless you. I don't know anybody that doesn't have idols. Best thing you can do is name them and let God start working on them. Are you trusting in God for everything? Mm. Now it comes to the point of, am I going to start listening to the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to change me or not? Can I, can I give an example? I'm not going to mention any names. I know of an absolutely beautiful young couple that God has blessed with an absolutely wonderful child. They are a godly couple. They were raised in church. Their parents did a great job in them. They have great fundamentals within them. And, and, and their, their child has potential. If I could pull a chair up here, I'd say that high. But you know what they've done? They bought into the way of the world so they're, they want to have everything for their child and they're chasing everything that the world says is important to provide for their child. Church just isn't important. It's not that they don't believe God. It's just God's number 28 on the, uh, on the priority list. This is a wonderful family with a wonderful child who I believe 
God could use this child in an exceedingly abundantly above great way. I mean, this is, there's so much of the anointing there, and yet all they're doing is chasing after wood, hay, and stubble. And when they get to the end of their life, they may be the most valuable player on earth and have missed the opportunity of that which matters. Idols. We all have them. <clears throat> Look what it says in verse number four. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Idols. Idols will bring you sorrow. Their drink offerings of blood, I will not offer. I will not even take up their names on my lips. I don't even want to speak the names of these things. He is saying, David is saying, you're my Lord. You're in charge of my life. I will go and do whatever you want me to do. Those things, I don't even want to mention those things. Lord, verse 5, you are the portion of my inheritance. You're my cup. You maintain my lot. You basically saying, you guard all that I have. You take it and you multiply it. Yes, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. The shepherd boy didn't stay in the field. He became the king of Israel. From the lowliest place, even his dad didn't think he had much in him, to God said that the line of the Christ will come through you. <clears throat> Verse 7, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel, his wisdom, his truths. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. How many of you have gone through night seasons? Difficult time. And yet the Spirit of God says you can trust Him. How many times I've prayed Romans 8, 28. I don't care what comes against me. God's got this. It's good. It may, some of the presence of life, God wraps in some, some funny paper, doesn't it? I mean, you look at those that have the, the beautiful paper and the great big bowl, and you think, oh, this is the most wonderful Christmas present. And you open it up, and it's handkerchiefs. And, and by the way, none of y'all have given me a handkerchief, so I'm okay. <laughs> but those other things that look like they're, you know, the ones that you open up and you go, oh, thank you. <laughs> but then you look back on it later and you go, yeah, thank you. That was a whole lot better than what I was expecting. How many of you in the night when your heart was heavy, but you were calling out and crying out to God and trusting in God, things seemed a lot lighter in the morning. Praise God for the night seasons that bring peace in the morning. Verse 8. I want you to hear verse 8. And I'm going to tell you why it's important. Verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. Let me read them all together. I have set the Lord always before me, Christian, you're just married out. Let me give you the greatest advice I could give any young couple. Make sure that the Lord is already always right in front of you. Be chasing after Him more than anything else. Don't ever compromise. I don't care what the world says. He says, I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. Hope. He is the Lord of hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the grave, hell, the death. For you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures. Come on, say it, say it with me together forevermore. Let's say it again. Forevermore. Why is verse 8 through verse 11 so important? Peter quoted it in Acts 2 when he was preaching at Pentecost. 
the Christ that comes. This is the one we've been waiting for. You can trust in Him. He will not leave you in the grave. He will take care of the one who is taking care of you. I wonder what we need to close the book on in 2023. Turn the page. Y'all hear me? So many people are waiting for God to do something like He did 50 years ago. You're going to wait. Because God is a God of today who goes forward. The children of Israel, they said, if we could just go back to the way it was in Egypt, How many of you know that's not going to work? You might like that. It won't bless. If we could just go back to what makes me comfortable, then everybody would come into the church. No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. Pastor, what's the church going to look like in 2028? I don't know. What's it going to look like in 33 and 43 and 53 and 63? I don't know, but I guarantee you it won't look like yesterday. When you see Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved, that was just the beginning. And they didn't see all those things coming, but God was faithful for them. And if the people will have the same attitude that those people had in that day. Lord, you are enough. You will watch over me. You will guide me. You will protect me. You will guard me. You will preserve me. It doesn't matter what I face. Praise be to the Father. Then 2024, though you may be uncomfortable Though you might not like everything that's coming, though you might like the election, though you might not like the election, I'm telling you that's not the answer. Christ is the answer. The world and all of AI, how many of you worried about artificial intelligence? I'm actually looking forward to some. I need some intelligence. Amen? I'm not worried about that, and I really don't care. That's not in my circle. My circle's... Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You hear me? What could God do in 2024 in your life, in your family, in our church? What could God do? What does God want to do? In you. It's not going to be something that you're going to enjoy all the time. But you will find it will give you grace and mercy and peace and love and patience and kindness and goodness. Basically, he'll give you fruit. Are you up for that? When we get to heaven, we're not going to say, man, I wish I'd spent more of my time working on the flowers in the yard. I like working with flowers in the yard. I planted 12 trees two weeks ago. But I'm not going to be celebrating that I wished I had done more of that. Billy Graham, y'all know Billy Graham? Can, Can we just vote? Godly man, one of your heroes, somebody who is so obedient to the Lord, his words at the end of his life, I wish I'd prayed more. I wish I'd spent more time in the Word. I wish I'd been more faithful. When we get to heaven, praise God that he's going to, give, he's going to sanctify our memory. I like that part. But he may be trying to sanctify your choices now. Some people need to get out of retirement and get back into the workplace. Some people need to quit talking about ease and start saying, Lord, how can I be faithful to you today? 
What is it God wants to do? I love David and his man. Come on. Because what he was doing was having a contemplation of though the trials were always there, God was always there. Turn the page. Close the chapter to yesterday. Let God write a new word. 